Hello, Pilates Stratosphere. Great to be with you. I am here with Mary Kirkaterp. Mary, welcome. Hi, Raf. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, my pleasure. I'm looking forward to our convo. So uh, can you introduce yourself to the Pilates Stratosphere, please? Yes. Um, hi, my name is Mary. I am a Pilates instructor based currently in Bangkok, Thailand. Um, I was uh, born in Ukraine. I grew up in Canada, in Toronto, and I spent my adult life in the UK, which is where I found Pilates uh, about 2010 and have been a student there ever since, completely obsessed by it, toying with the idea of becoming instructor. And um, in 2020, my family moved to Thailand during COVID. We had a new baby. Uh, my husband's family lives here. And I found that this was the perfect time to start my Pilates career. So yeah, here we are. I delve into studying anatomy and then went in for training in Bangkok. And as of June 2022, I have received my certification from Stop Pilates and have been teaching ever since. Oh, congratulations. I didn't know that story. Uh, and uh, you're truly an international citizen of the world. And uh, it's it's interesting that you lived in Toronto, uh, the the epicenter of the Stop Pilates universe, uh, but you didn't discover Stop Pilates until you went to the UK. <laughs> That's right, isn't that funny? So um, I did I did all of the all of the studios in the UK. I was one of those people that loved the first trial class for free. So I was still I think I was just out of uni and I had no money and I was just bouncing between studios, trying all these different instructors, all these different studios really helped me to find what I liked. Um, I did go home for half a year, I think, and I got to go to the Stop Pilates headquarters in Young and Eglinton in Toronto. And yeah, it was it was a if it was definitely a different experience from what I'd experienced in the UK. You know, they had um, I, I actually really loved it because it they had a very specific way to teach and it was very technical. And I really liked that. It really worked for me. Yeah, I, I trained did a lot of training at Young and Eglinton there and uh, yeah and it actually remind it, you you your accent to my ear anyway it sounds quite Canadian like the way you say Toronto without without yeah, the T. Yeah <laughs> yeah I, I very diligently tried to keep my Canadian accent I think it sounds very silly when it starts to do the merging. <laughs> um, so set this conversation up for us please Mary like yeah how, what are we going to talk about today and why are we going to talk about it? Yeah, so I reached out to you, Raf, in a state of semi-panic, <laughs> um, genuine confusion. I just had finished my certificate, or my exams, actually. I'd finished my exams. I got the certification. I had a wonderful job coming up, and I found your podcast, and I just love the name of it. Before anything, my daughter's favorite animal is elephant, so I, I'm a Pilates instructor. It just really, I was like, oh, this could be fun. And then you started talking about these topics that really, um, really kind of blew my mind. <laughs> you, um, one of my, I think you spoke to a weakness in my own, my own professional development. So I, during my studies and while I was training, um, I had a very hard time with the postural analysis. I found that to be, for some reason, it wasn't, it, I don't think it would ever come naturally to to me anyway, but it, it just wasn't clicking. There was something about it. And it was quite an emotional experience for me um, learning it and then being examined, uh, being in the examination process where I had to actually fit, formally analyze a posture. And that was always my Achilles heel of my, of my training. And then when I found your podcast and you started debunking things like postural analysis, I really, I think you've described it before in previous episodes as a paradigm shift, but that's exactly what I started to experience. I thought, wait a minute, if this isn't considered best practice anymore, then what else is there? What else, what else is happening in the, in the world of movement? And I started to listen. I, I really just like binged, listen to you. And it started to, and this is the same time as I started to teach, and I started to teach a lot of group classes, and I had private students. So I had this, all of this training that I just completed, it took like a year, 
And then all of a sudden, I'm learning all of these new things, all of this new information that was making a lot of sense to me. Yet coming back to the client, I was still, I was still talking about everything I had learned only in my training, not incorporating all of the new things I was learning from you. So I had this, and I, I do think it's called imposter syndrome. And I'm glad there's a, there's a term for it because it makes it sound a little bit more manageable. But I had this sense of, what am I doing? What am I preaching? How do I know what I stand for? And I thought, let's go to the source and let's message Raphael Bender and ask him to help me. And here we are. Hmm. That is such such an interesting, like you really took me back to, to my early kind of experience, a very similar experience. But I think yours was even more acute that basically at the same time as you graduated your certification and like just at the moment when you're like great I've you know I get it it's like at that very moment that's when you started to question everything and go is this yeah. true <laughs> then you messed it all up for me I really finally got it I was like I got the posture of analysis I know the moves I know the counts I know how to cue breathing and everything and then you came in with your podcast <laughs> Yeah, and so at that very moment, as you're starting to launch yourself out into your teaching, uh, you you're teaching the way that you've been taught to teach because you've just been practicing teaching that way for a year. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, and at the same time, you're starting to really question whether that's the the best way to do it. Exactly. That's exactly so, it. So, what did you? So, well, you know, there is so much contradictory information around. And so, you know, because you messaged me a few months back, it's taken us a while to set up this, this conversation. Um, and, you know, so, so how have you been, you know, what's come up for you? What thoughts, what emotions? Have you found a solution, you know, since, since we last talked? Where, where are you at? Uh, so since we've last spoken, I think I have... I guess almost seven months coming up under my belt of proper teaching full time. Um, and I think, I think what's, what's helped since my initial sort of panic message to you and where I'm at now is that experience actually does wonders. So the, the, the initial question of what do I stand for? What am I preaching to my clients? Um, I think I could have read even more literature and listened to you. 12 hours a day and until I stepped into a studio and actually did the work and and worked with bodies I think that's when I started to really figure out okay this is what works this is what doesn't work um I would also like to I write straight at the beginning of this episode I would like to say that I'm not here to trash any um contemporary or classical Pilates institutions at by any means. I have so much respect for them. And it is because of them that I love this method of movement so much. It's just, I think that I like the idea of science and research backing movement modalities. And I like the idea of us using Pilates and taking it into this new new era of Pilates. And I'm very interested to find out for all of us newbies, how do we do that? Um, so yeah, I think listening to you, really listening to the words you said, I think studying more anatomy, not just anatomy in the sense of the names of the body parts, but actually the function of the body parts. What do they do? I started to work with a mentor. So I had this wonderful mentor from um, a school here, a Korean school called Modern Pilates. And she explained to me sort of why when you're on the Cadillac and say your wrists are starting to to give out or your fingers are starting to let go, how come that muscle, it's not because you have weak wrists. It's actually your your muscles in your back, they're not strong enough. So the muscles in your hands are starting to take over and you're starting to let go. So it was that kind of connection. It's not just the names of the muscle group. It's, what, it's what's going on in the body. And when I started to really understand what was happening anatomically, how the body was moving and listening to you and starting to understand that it's not just the biomechanics that are that people are coming in for in your session it's also the psychosocial factor it really helped me become this rounded or well 
better rounded um, Pilates instructor that I do very much want to be. It, the, the whole experience became not just about the small technical parts, but actually taking it into a much bigger picture. Hmm. Sounds like you're a lot further along your path than you were seven months ago. <laughs> Hopefully, yes. That's where we're going. So, so, and it sounds like, so getting out and teaching really was the thing that, that gave you, that has given you more clarity and confidence. Yes. Yes. The hands-on experience, watching people actually move, knowing what the move is supposed to look like, let's say, and then watching different bodies do that same move. Yeah. That was, that was the best teacher of all. Like we did it in observation. I definitely did it in my training, but when you're doing it all the time and really watching, and right now I, I teach private classes only. So I do privates or, or duets. So uh, doubles. Like I really get to focus on each body part and that, that is, that has been my best teacher. Definitely. Hmm. So yeah, you were just telling me off air just before we started about the conversation that you had with your husband just before um, <laughs> and what you wanted to get out of this conversation. So do you mind just resharing that? Yes. So uh, my husband, bless him, he is in a completely different field. And sometimes I think it's great to bounce ideas off of someone who has no idea what your industry is about and ask questions. And I said, Jasper, what would you, if you had the opportunity to speak to somebody who, who you held in, very, in such high regard in your industry, what would you ask him? And my husband very cleverly told me, he said, you have to figure out what you want out of the conversation yourself. He said, do you want to have this conversation be about how much you, how much respect you have for this, this person? Or do you want to, is there a goal for you and for those in your position? Yeah. This is me sort of meeting my hero and <laughs> not being disappointed so far. Your husband sounds like a wise, wise person. <laughs> yes. Um, and so what, all right. So I'm assuming that it's the second, you know, you arrived at the, the second thing, right? So you, this is not just like you won't, yeah. you don't want to just spend like an hour telling me how awesome I am. You'd rather mm -hmm. like, get something useful out of the, <laughs> the Yeah. I'm sure you hear it all day though. So let's, <laughs> let's take it to the second part. Yeah. yeah I re but I would, I would love to ask you some questions because your experience is, if I hadn't discovered you, but I'd started to discover the, some of the information that you are bringing to light, then I hope that my career would have taken this, a similar path that you have already been on. That's what makes you such a great person to speak to because hmm. you've already done all the things that I would, would have loved to do going all right, forward. So let's start there. Well, I'm, I guess not start because we're already like 15 minutes in, but, <laughs> but, um, Let's go there. So what it, so that's, a, that's actually a question that I uh, wanted to ask you anyway, which is like, okay, well, where would you like, you know, where would, what sort of, where do you want to go? Like what kind of instructor do you want to be in a year or in five years? That's a great question. Um, I have a brother who is in, he's sort of bouncing in between. So he's in Toronto and he's, finishing off his kinesiology degree and he's going into athletic conditioning. He's such an interesting person to talk to when I was home this summer. Him and I would just sit in the kitchen and just talk about, he has such a great knowledge of um, biomechanics and physiology and from a very, very, um, I'm not, I don't think this is the correct term, but it's on a basic level, but from the biological level, like he really understands from, from the cells and he has a knowledge that I don't have yet. And I, in my training so far and where I am so far, he really made me see that this is definitely a, a path that I would like to take. So learning more, not just Pilates, but more movement and the science of movement in a year, I would definitely love to have a lot more of an understanding I mean, he's gone through four years of this. You see, I also don't have time on my side. I have a baby. <laughs> so I'm really looking at how do I do this? How do I do this in the best way possible? Time efficient, but also uh, maximum knowledge absorbency. Mm. Um, yeah. So that, that like, this is why I said you've sort of done 
everything that I think I would have loved to do, but you've are, you're already on the other side of it. So this is a, such an interesting conversation for me. Hmm. Well, my uh, my experience with going through university because I was I was in my forties when I went back to university. I'd been teaching Pilates for a decade or, or so. Uh, and so I was the same as you. I felt like I know kind of all of the names and the muscles and the things, but I, I didn't feel like I really got it at a deep, you know, cellular level. Like I didn't, I didn't really have a picture in my mind of what a cell was or what a nerve impulse was or what the difference between a tendon and a ligament is like on a structural level. Or, you know, like I didn't know any of that stuff and I wanted to. And I felt like I was missing out on a lot of results and understanding a lot of stuff. Um, and so I went back to uni and I did – a bachelor's of exercise science, which is the same thing as what you call kinesiology um, in North America, and then a master's. And really, I think I got so much from those degrees, but I think unless you want the qualification, like to be an exercise scientist or an exercise physiologist, like you want that piece of paper, um, probably the degree, you know, probably of the, the years that I spent, probably like one full year, was really valuable and the rest of it was filler. You know, like you have to learn so much bullshit when you do a degree. Like we had to learn, we did the psychology subject. I remember it. And the, the exam was about like the history of the American psychological association. Like what was the name of the first female president of the APS, you know? Um, and you know, BF, the, the theories of BF Skinner, you know, were in what period, the blah, 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 the behaviorists, the, blah, blah. you know, it's like, who gives a shit and how's that going to help me as a Pilates instructor, you know, as a movement teacher. So there's just so much like filler that you have to learn when you do a degree and the actual, like the gold, you know, the anatomy, the physiology, the biomechanics, all of that stuff that was, is, I think, you know, essentially timeless principles of, of human movement. That was about a quarter of it, um, but it it wasn't like okay, year one was all the good stuff and everything else was a waste. It was like one subject in first semester and one subject in second semester and one subject in year two. You know, like so it's like you couldn't really just go, oh, I'll just do first year and then drop out or something and get all the good stuff. So, but I think you can get all of that information and all of that skill and knowledge without doing a degree. I mean, I'm I'm in favour of doing degrees if you if you like degrees, but. I think you can get all of that skill and knowledge and information in a quarter of the time by just selecting the right sources and only learning what you what you need to know, not all the not all the other crap. Yes, so yeah. I, I got that from you when you started showing how many books you've read over the years, <laughs> and I saw your mountain of of literature that you read huh. on on the human movement. <laughs> And I was like, wow, he can actually now, I think people are very good at teaching when they can simplify what yeah. all of these complex ideas, right? And I think that's the, what, what you and your institution are doing. I, this, this is what attracts me to breathe education. I think what you have done is you've taken all of this knowledge. It's not like, and you've made it more succinct. So as somebody who is time, time pressured, this is actually a really great. Right. And just to be clear, you're you're you haven't done a course with us yet, right? Like you're not. No, a student, no, right? I haven't done a course yeah. with you. I have your book, so yeah. I am currently listening to your book. And yes, I have not yeah. done a course with you. I'm listening to your book, and I'm listening to your podcast. Um, I think there are two things there. You know, like sometimes I, you know, like. I think everybody just thinks of themselves as normal, right? Like you've only got your own experience to go by yeah. and you don't know anything different from what goes on inside your own head. Um, but I, th I think that two, two things that I really think are really valuable are the ability to read something and reflect on it and understand it. And, and like everything that you need to know to be an amazing plays instructor is in a book somewhere. You know, there are, there, are, there, there are literally mountains of books of text, of anatomy and behavior change and exercise science and physiology and neuroanatomy, like all of those, all, everything, it's all in books, right? And, you know, you can get it from other places as well, for sure. Um, uh, and I don't think people should just read books. I think there, there's a definite value to experiential learning. 
but everything you need to know is in a book somewhere. And I, th- you know, one of the things I learned, one of the big things I learned at uni was they essentially just made me read the textbooks. You know, like they, they give you, they make you buy this big 500 page textbook for $300 and then they make you read the whole freaking thing. You know, you have to read 22 pages a day in order to get to the end of it by the semester. And then every week they give you a test on the, whatever chapter you just read, right? So that they know that you've read it. And so you, there's no hiding. You can't pretend to read it. Like, you, cause you've got, you know, these long answer questions on freaking explain the physiology of a nerve impulse or whatever and you can't you can't fake that very <laughs> very easily so you have to read it but what i realized at you know some part way through my degree was like actually there's not a lot of teaching that's going on aside from just reading the textbook like they're just making me read the textbook and so the realization there was uh-huh. when I went to uni, what they basically did was just made us read the book and you had to read the book every day and then you had to test every week. And then that just essentially at the end of the, well, some part of the way through the degree, I actually realized like, hold on, most of what I'm learning here is actually just coming from the textbook. You know, there's not a lot of, not a lot of knowledge that I'm getting from the lectures that the basic lectures is like, Hey, you just read this in chapter four. Here it is. I'm like, yeah, I just read it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, and so I thought, well, what a rip off, you know, they're just making me read the book, but I'm like, well, I could have read this book for the last 25 years, but I didn't. Yeah. Um, and so the, I think the value for me, a large part of the value of the uni was they actually just told me, okay, read this book, now read this book, now read this book. And I was like, okay. So I read all the books and they're like, yeah. oh, now I know stuff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in theory, I could have done it, you know, without paying all that tens of thousands of dollars and spending years. Uh, and so if if you just want the knowledge, uh Go, just go read the books, you know, like literally go to, go to a, a great university website, you know, that like, if you like your brother's university or whatever, go there, look up their book list, go buy the books, read them. Yeah. And just start to read them. And it's not, it's interesting you say that because it's in hindsight, right? You've done, you've had the experience and now looking back, this is what, this is what you found. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. So. I mean, or I could even send you across a couple of books or whatever, like, you know, names of a couple of books, but yeah, like it's all in books, it's all in books. And so I think the ability to, but thing is, why didn't I read the textbook for 25 years? Cause it's hard, right? A lot of textbooks, they're dense with information. It's, you know, you read, you know, many times you sit there, you read a paragraph, you're like, I didn't understand a single word. You have to read it back again and again and again, and, you know, and you realize like you're just reading the words, but it's not going into your brain or whatever. And so it's hard work. It is. <laughs> right. It's hard work. You it's have to work. think, yep. you know, um, and so you have to use strategies. Like you can't just literally sit there and read the book from cover to cover because like your brain will, it, you know, your just brain will turn off, you know, unless you're superhuman. So you need to, you need to be. That self-starting. Yeah. But uh, like, it's hard, right? It's hard work, but there are lots of, there are a couple of really simple strategies you can use uh, called one is distributed practice. So if you're going to read an hour a day, you're better to read like, three lots of 20 minutes because uh-huh. right? you can probably concentrate for 20 minutes pretty easily, but an hour of reading a dense textbook on the, you know, density of proteins in a cellular wall or whatever, you know, there's, it gets like pretty hard to concentrate, you know, when you think like, Oh, I might just check what's on Facebook. Or, <laughs> <you know. laughs> um, um, so doing it in short bursts is evidence-based way of, of getting more, value out of the time that you spend and also practice testing. So all textbooks now, I think, have little tests at the end of each chapter. Do the tests. Do the tests and don't look at the answers until you've done the test, right? And then look at the answers and then redo the test. So that, yeah, that helps it. That really helps it stick. That's a powerful way of of internalizing and knowing that information. Mm-hmm. That's a very good yeah. one. It actually leads me into a question I wanted to ask you because you brought you brought up the term Um, for all of us newbies and anybody that's just starting to listen to your podcast, can you explain what does evidence-based actually mean? Uh, well, I'd say in the context of, in the Pilates world, I'd say it means, or when I say it, I mean giving best practice care as defined by high quality physical activity guidelines and clinical practice guidelines. So if I went and looked in the, the American College of Sports Medicine or, uh, you know, whatever sort of national guidelines, the World Health Organization, physical activity guidelines for healthy adults or, or whatever, and 
that would say, okay, we recommend you do, you know, this much of this type of exercise at this intensity, you know, every week. Uh, and so if, and, you know, they, they don't make those recommendations based on nothing. They, they synthesize literally thousands of research papers to, you know, come up with what is current best practice. Uh, and guidelines are the literal definition of best practice. So, yeah, just basically following guidelines is the short version. No, that's a real, that's very good because it's a term you hear a lot, you and and your guests say, but you Google it and it means one thing. It's always good to hear hear you say it and really what you mean by it. So thank you. Well, I, yeah, I think there's, you know, there's a, I think there there's a little bit more to it that I think is probably worth mentioning, which is that, you know, like adherence to guidelines in the Pilates world is pretty low, but that's no ill reflection on Pilates in particular because adherence to guidelines in the whole health and fitness field is pretty low. Like um, uh, in, you know, according to in physical activity guidelines, there were a couple of studies uh, in the sort of mid 2010s that found that um, 33% of final year medical students are unfamiliar with physical activity guidelines. And we've talked about this on the show before, but let me just mention that the physical activity guidelines, if you look at the ACSM guidelines, American College of Sports Medicine or the World Health Organization guidelines, they're the same regardless of with guidelines, the Australian guidelines for healthy adults. They're, they're all the same because they're all based on the same science, okay, which is 150 to 300 minutes a week of moderate intensity cardio. So that's where you're very slightly out of breath, like brisk walking. Right, so 150 to 300 minutes a week, and two to three resistance training sessions per week, which is when a resistance training session is when you bring all your muscles to you know near to fatigue, right? So you get to the point where it's getting hard to continue, right? So do that two to three times a week, briskly walk or swim or cycle or jog or do whatever, some kind of moderate intensity cardio where you're slightly out of breath for 150 to 300 minutes a week. Those those are the physical activity guidelines. Now, I was able to explain those to you in 30 seconds. And I actually went through each guideline like twice, okay? Um, but according to these studies, um, 33% of final year medical students are unfamiliar with the guidelines, don't know the content of the guidelines, right? You think that's, it's not that hard to remember, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> um, 59% of personal trainers, like their actual whole job is giving exercise to people. <laughs> they don't know these guidelines, <laughs> 56% of exercise physiologists, which is shameful because they've got a freaking four-year degree in exercise oh. <laughs> and they don't know physical activity guidelines, <laughs> more than half. And 53% of people with a PhD in exercise science or kinesiology don't know, <laughs> aren't unable to identify <laughs> what the content of current physical activity guidelines is. So this is not <laughs> just a Pilates industry problem. Right. This is this is this is widespread and rampant everywhere. But I th- I think there's a I think there's a duty of care, which is the duty that you know every person has a duty of care to others, like to not inflict. That's a legal and moral obligation that we all have to not to to not inflict harm and to avoid any reasonably foreseeable harm. You know, so it's like if I walk down the street swinging a baseball bat around my head, I can't, and then I hit someone with it. I can't go, oh, I didn't mean to hit anyone. You know, it was just an accident. It's like, yeah, I should have known that that was a stupid thing to do and I would probably hit someone, right? So so I have a duty of care not to do that. Um, and, and so we all have a duty of care, um, you know, but those of us who are trained in health and fitness have a more... Um, uh, I guess a higher duty of care, a bigger duty of care, um, in relation to our training, right? So, for instance, if you are, if you work in a hospital and you are a nurse, okay, and you're, you know, you walk down the the corridor and you see a patient shuffling down the corridor and they collapse, right? There'd be certain things that you would be expected to do based on the level of training that you have. Like you couldn't just walk away in the other direction, right? You would have to go and render assistance and you would be expected to do certain things and not to do, like if you sort of, I don't know, gave them a coffee enema or something, you know, that wouldn't be considered good quality care. That's not the solution, is it? (laughs) Right. So, but if you did, you know, whatever the things are that, you know, like someone collapsed, I guess you'd check their breathing and their airway and their pulse and their, you know, all of those things, right? The first aid things, right? But you wouldn't give them maybe an emergency tracheostomy or administer drugs to them or whatever, right? But if you were, say, an emergency room surgeon, okay, and you're walking down the corridor and a patient collapses, 
you would be expected to do a different set of things. Maybe you would administer drugs. Maybe you would administer, you know, some kind of surgical procedure for that person, right? And But it wouldn't just be like any drug. Like if you just gave them like, I don't know, heroin, right? That wouldn't be acceptable. That wouldn't be considered best practice. But if you gave them an appropriate drug based on the symptoms and signs that they were presenting, right, that is defined in, there's a set of clinical guidelines for emergency room surgery somewhere, right, that says if someone has, if someone has, for instance, a stroke, the best practice care is to, if it's a um, thrombotic stroke with a blood clot, the best practice care, as far as I'm aware, is to administer aspirin within two or three hours, right? So if you if if I come to the emergency room and you're the emergency room surgeon and I'm having a stroke, okay, and you don't give me aspirin within three hours, you you face a malpractice suit, right? Because because it's because aspirin is defined as as far as I'm aware, I'm not an emergency surgeon, but that's the last time I heard. Okay, is aspirin is if you've got a thrombotic stroke, is the current best practice care? And how do we know it's best practice care? Well, it's in a clinical guideline. Right, it's in a clinical guideline that's based on thousands of research papers that has been synthesized together and they go, okay, we know that if we have 100 people come to the emergency room having a thrombotic stroke and we give them all aspirin, many more of them are going to survive with a much lower level of disability compared to if we don't give them aspirin. Right, So we, so that is now everyone has to do that. And so that's what guideline-based care is. And that just says that, you know, we have this, so I think as Pilates instructors, we have a duty of care. Like we're giving exercises to people. I think we have a duty of care to give the best possible care possible, right? Like, you know, and, and the best possible care is what's in the guidelines, right? Because this is really like thousands of really smart people have spent decades figuring out what is best care by doing research and it's there, there for you in the guidelines. So I think that's our duty of care is to work within the guidelines. Makes sense. Yeah. So that Putting that all together, when you say evidence-based practice specific to our industry, you are summarizing it as evidence, uh, sorry, as care, as, sorry, <laughs> um, it's basically based on the guidelines of best practice that are currently available and they will be changing. So it's not like the evidence-based care stays where it is now. It will right keep progressing and it is our job as the instructor or as the professional to continue to update your skill set with the knowledge that comes out over time correct correct amundo good okay we're on the same page but actually that leads me into another question um what are so since how how long is your career span now how many years would you say uh, well, I started as a personal trainer in 1998, and then I became a Pilates instructor in 2004. Mm-hmm. I'm now 2023, so I've been a Pilates instructor coming up on 19 years. Mm-hmm. And and in that time, so based on everything that you now that, that you now teach through your school and through your, your educational uh, program, what are are there things that have not changed since the beginning of your career? So. What are three things, let's say, if you have three things? Well, actually, the guidelines themselves haven't changed much. Like the 2001 guidelines are pretty similar to, like in terms of physical activity guidelines, in terms of pain management guidelines are very similar now to what they were 21 years, 22 years ago. Uh, But I didn't know about the guidelines when I was a kid in Pilates years. I was like you. I was like, oh, I just learned this I just learned Pilates. I don't even think of it as stop Pilates. I just learned Pilates. You know, I didn't know that there was a different sort of Pilates <laughs> and I didn't know that there was any, there was like guidelines that applied to Pilates instructors. Cause according, like, even though many of us in the Pilates world think like, oh, fitness is a different thing to Pilates. 99% of the fitness world sees Pilates as a subset of fitness. You know, it's one particular type of fitness activity. Um, uh, and so, yeah, anyway, so the guidelines haven't really changed a lot in the last couple of decades, but my knowledge of them has uh, changed a lot. Um, I think uh, my admiration, admiration for John Gary has remained pretty constant over that time. She is pretty great, isn't um, <laughs> she? Uh, John, if you're listening, you're awesome. Um I think in terms of the Pilates industry, there's been like the, 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 the big things have been, the big feature I think has been change, the speed of change in the Pilates industry. You know, like in 2004, group reformer wasn't even a thing at all anywhere. 
uh, you know, it was like everyone had to start learning mat work and then you maybe went on and learned all the other equipment. And then when you taught the equipment, it was like you did some stuff on the Cadillac, then you did some stuff on the reform and then you did stuff some stuff on the barrels. Like it was, yeah, it was very, very different, I think. Uh, and the, the, and now there's online and there's like, there's so much you know, knowledge available now that I think probably was there before, but with the internet, like 2004 was almost freaking pre-internet, you know, yeah, <laughs> like, oh the God. iPhone wasn't even invented. <laughs> yeah. There were phones, mobile phones were kind of not with, not with I had the my internet, Nokia though, right? 6310 yeah. or something, you know, like, I think the first iPhone came out in 20, 2007. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Totally different time. But that's that's why I asked the question. So it seems like the things that have stuck around are quite important to know because it's it's the the things in the industry that haven't changed. And you've listed John Gary as a staple <laughs> your admiration for John Gary. But also the um the guidelines and sorry and then and then we go you're saying that, that they are changing. Yeah, that, that change is inevitable. So accept it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think also, right. I mean Contrology hasn't changed, you know, like Return to Life Through Contrology was published in the 1940s and, you know, <laughs> hasn't changed. And so um, that's why we actually now teach Contrology instead of, like I learned like you, Stop Pilates, um, uh, but we don't teach contemporary or classical now, we teach Contrology, which is like the pre-classical version and that is not because we think that's better than classical or contemporary but because it's the most original and i feel like um as you know time marches on seasons come and go fashions come and go different eras of pilates you know precede um each other but yep. the one thing that's never going to change is how it started yes oh. uh, and so I've, i feel like that's that's i don't and I, again i don't think it's better uh -huh. than classical contemporary. But I, I just, I really think of it like when you buy clothes, if you buy classic styles, classic colors, that they go, don't go out of fashion. If you buy this year's latest thing, you know, uh -huh. next year you can't wear it. Uh, you know? uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I know what you mean. No, but it makes sense. You want to stay true to the, to the practice in the sense that the thing that hasn't changed, despite the inevitable fact that there will be change, is the original the original the contrology essentially as you say yeah well I, I i i yeah i mean i don't really see it as staying true to it like i i'm very in many ways i'm an anti-traditionalist so i don't like i think joseph pilates was in many ways a visionary genius and you know i pay him a lot of respect but you know he had his flaws he was wrong about a lot of stuff you know he had some wacky ideas as well uh, and so I don't, I don't think that every, every word that came out of his mouth was, you know, truth from on high, but, you know, I think there's a lot of value in that original contrology method in the original contrology repertoire. Um, and I feel like, you know, I don't, I, I, with classic, you know, like there's just been eras and there's been eras in Pilates, you know, after Joseph passed away in 1962, uh, Romana became sort of the, 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 the head of Pilates and she was a dancer and all her, her friends were dancers and she opened the Pilates studio. You know, Joseph, Joseph had a Pilates gym, you know, a contrology gym, you know, uh, and she opened a studio and was all chic and frou-frou and, you know, and that's, and it was all about dancing and, you know, being elegant and doing the dancer hands when you do mermaid and all of those things, right. Which I'm not having a go at, Right, but that it, that's that kind of changed the character of it, and then in the sort of nineties and two thousands, kind of when Romana was you know taking a a best step back, and and the next generation of people that she had trained were then stepping forward, and that's you know um, Maura Merithew Nee Stott was one of those people, um, and they you know that next generation, a lot of them incorporated you know what was like at the time the kind of zeitgeist within the health and fitness world, which was, you know, biomechanics principles and neutral spine and muscle activation and core control and, um, you know, transverse abdominus retraining, all of that stuff came from the nineties and early two thousands. You know, the, that was what you would learn in your kinesiology degree in 1999, you know? Um, and so that, you know, that was a kind of an, uh, that was a moment in time or, an, you know, a, a decade in time. And I think, you know, with the, the, the reason I'd, 
stopped doing uh, contemporary Pilates is I felt like that kind of got stuck in that moment. You know, they incorporated science from, you know, that era, the 1990s, 2000s, but then they didn't move on when the science moved on. They kind of got, they, they, they kind of got stuck in that era. That's my, that's what I experienced from within Stop Pilates. And, and I feel like, well, the next, whatever comes after that, right? If we, if we went and said, like, oh, we're doing our 2020 science, right? But in 10 years, it'll be 2030, right? And then 2020 science will be out of date, right? So, <laughs> so there's, there's no, there's no point at which it's going to stand still. But the only thing that stands still is the origin. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. That's ne- it's never going to be like, oh, this is the new version of Contrology because it's like, no, the Contrology was what Joseph Pilates wrote about in his book. Is you know, so so that's that's why we choose that, not because it's better than contemporary. I think contemporary's got a lot of things to offer. I think classical has a lot of things to offer, but just because it's not, I don't think it's going to come in and out of. I mean, it might come in, come in and out of fashion, but it's never not going to be the original. Yeah. Yep, it'll stay that that's something that will stay the same. That's an interesting way to look at it. Actually, can I can I continue on with my question? Sorry, I have so much to ask you. <laughs> but um in that same breath, what I, I think you said at the beginning that this conversation's kind of bringing you back to the early years of your own career, but uh and and things have changed, right, over the last 19 years. What do you think is something or, or are some things that I will find a challenge that you didn't necessarily find a challenge? Uh, information overload. Information overload. Uh, when, I, when I first learned to stop Pilates, you know, pre-iPhone, um, everything was paper, books, and you get the, your DVDs that you, you know, and, and so there was no – there was no conflicting information. Well, there was conflicting information, but I didn't have an access to it, you know? Um, whereas now, you know, you know, you've got podcasts, you've got YouTube, you've got all of these things on your phone and it's very easy to be overwhelmed by all the conflicting information. So I think that's something that, that, you know, is, is, is much more challenging now. Definitely. Um, yeah. I think you hit the nail yeah. on the head. Yeah. It is. It, think- it was. It was part of that overwhelming feeling as well. So when I was, like you said, I just came out of my training, just finished my exams, just finished. Uh, sorry, just starting to teach, and I discovered you. Right, you're all the way in Australia, <laughs> um, yeah. and you and your information. It came at, at the exact same time as I was starting to go into the, the industry professionally, and it really was. It, it was such an overwhelming feeling, of there's so much I need. There's so much more I need to learn very quickly. Yeah, so you, you've hit the nail on the head with that one. So, yeah, so how are you navigating that? That overwhelming feeling? Yeah, because, um, I mean, it's not just it's not just my podcast, right? There's a bazillion other, you know, if you type in Pilates podcasts into Spotify or whatever, like there's Oh, yeah, you know, hundreds, there's, there's you know. really so, but, but thank God for it as well in a sense that, you know, you do have that opportunity to grow and you have all these resources and online schools as well to develop your skill set. Um, as somebody who, my schedule is quite busy, just like many people uh, in any industry, and it's really nice to have access to things and I'm grateful for it. And to be honest, I can't even imagine life without it now that I'm in it. Um, I like to have the, I, my I have a very positive view of technology and and all that it can bring. Although there was a night where my husband and I were trying to watch film and the TV was just not working. Netflix was just not coming on. And we're just like, we wish we had a DVD player. This was so easy. <laughs> you could just pop a DVD in and then it's done. No, now we have to hook things up and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and this and that. So yeah, there's, yeah, it's, it's a fine balance. Um, but how I'm navigating it is to really to have these conversations. So have these conversations with you, have these conversations with my mentor, have these conversations with studio owners. There's so many. What I really love about the Pilates industry is uh, is it is an industry that you go into to help people. And that's not just through movement. You go into it because you want people the best for people, at least a specific, for me, 100%. This is why your method of evidence-based teaching really works for me because it made me see that it's not just the technical biomechanical knowledge that I'm giving to my clients 
every session. It's also that feeling of, hi, welcome to the studio. Like you have a friend for an hour. We can have a really good time. We can talk about whatever you want to talk about. And that personability and that um, psychosocial factor, as you as you call it, like that really, that's gold in this industry because the feedback that I get is, wow, Mary, it really feels like you know my body. That means the world to me because through all the training that I've been to, that means like something, something's clicked and something's working. But also I really love spending time. I love coming here. I love spending time with you. That feedback means everything to me. And I love my job because of things like that. So yeah, that's how I navigate through it. I just, I keep talking to my clients. I talk to people and yeah, <laughs> that's it. That's my answer. That, I think that's a great <laughs> strategy. And aren't yeah. we so lucky to be in a job where our clients just love love coming to work with us? It really, <laughs> you know? yeah, it really is the best. Honestly, I haven't had a day. I have very early classes as well. We start at seven sometimes. And I never used to be a morning person. And you know what? I really am now. I really enjoy that like morning, the, the sunrise and everything and having some of my favorite clients come in. It's just so nice. And what's really great about the industry is people are not stingy with their information. So the people that I come across, other instructors, are very happy to tell you what they think and their opinions and how they are trying to grow. And I, I feel very lucky to be in an industry where that's, at least in my experience, that seems to be the norm. Yeah, I think I think there's that's wonderful about this industry. And I 100% agree. Like, I think just about everyone, I think I would say everyone in this industry is is a helper you know yes. we're, we're in it because we we like we want to help people we want to make a difference for other people yes um it's funny that you mentioned that about dvds i'm sorry my mind just got, went back there because <laughs> my daughter's 16 and and it's, she's all about the retro stuff at the moment and for oh, her okay. now retro is like what was cutting edge tech for me when i was 20 uh so she's got herself a dvd player and a cd player and she's now building up this collection of cds it's like we well, she could just stream them on Spotify, but no, she prefers yeah. to play it. She wants the, the physical one. But oh. now, but now I remember it. She's going like, oh, but then it's kept skipping. Oh, I can't uh, figure out why it's. You know, it's right. It, you know, it's like yeah, that's right. Yeah, it did yeah. skip. You did have to keep it in pristine condition. Oh my god. Oh, that's making me feel very old. Thanks. <laughs> no, she's right. Sixteen-year-old, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah everything 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 new is old yeah that is old it, is new it's that yeah yeah well that's some to be said for our industry as well you never know maybe we will go back to the uh uh the old no maybe biomechanics was was the thing to pay attention to this whole time <laughs> maybe we'll teeter back to that in 10 years <laughs> uh, I I don't think so. I mean, I think I mean I love biomechanics. I have a freaking degree in biomechanics, yeah. um, uh, and I think biomechanics is extremely valuable for some parts of exercise programming. Like if you want to understand how to improve, you know, speed or strength or power, or you know, biomechanics is very important. Um, uh, but in terms of just like safety in the Pilates room, it's essentially useless. And I don't think that's going to change because what we've got is pretty good evidence that it doesn't make a difference. Um, and so that's not going to, we're not all of a sudden going to find that it does make a difference. So, um, but what might change is like currently we think the best, you know, the best thing is what you mentioned, that's this biopsychosocial approach, which, um, which conceives of, of pain as an emergent property an emergent phenomena that is results from this complex interaction between your biology. So that would be including biomechanics, but you know, lots of things like sleep, physiology, hormones, stress chemicals, you know, lots of stuff floating around in your blood, inflammation, et cetera. So biology, psychology, our thoughts, our beliefs, our emotions, and then social context. So, you know, the cultural zeitgeist, the meanings we make of things based on the societal kind of norms and, and, um, you know, support or lack of support from other people. So all of these things interact in this really complex way that we don't fully understand or don't even very well partially understand. And pain can emerge as 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 a result of some incredibly complicated interaction between these factors. And so the best practice treatment we've got at the moment is try and address all of that, right? So address the whole person, you know, we address thoughts, beliefs, emotions, stress, sleep, 
you know, social support, all of these physical activity, all of these things. Right. And so that is kind of best practice, but we, we kind of just kind of like peppering the goalpost at the moment because we don't really know what the true, you know, cause is. Right. So we just go like, well, let's kind of do a bit of everything because we know all of this is part of it, but we can't, it's kind of a black box. We can't see inside it. Right. So it might be that in five years, 10 years, 20 years, we get more insight and we'll go, ah, it's actually more this thing, right? And it might be something that we don't yet know. It might be some, you know, weird thing like how long your hair is or something. I don't know, but, you know, something Imagine we haven't. Imagine if it was that. <laughs> <laughs> something we haven't even thought of yet, right? <laughs> right, um, yeah. It might be some other factor or it might just be that we get a better understanding of the interrelationship between stress and sleep and inflammation and hormones and you know, beliefs and social support and whatever. And we are able to do more targeted interventions, maybe identify, you know, more accurately, which of those things we need to focus on, you know? So, so I think best practice care probably almost certainly, hopefully <laughs> will change over the next decade. Okay. But I, it's not going to go back to, oh, it was the biomechanics all along, right? Because we've, we've ruled that out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what would you say is actually the best way to keep up to date? with um with all of this what's the best resource um, what are the best resources so here's what i recommend mm -hmm. acsm's guidelines for exercise testing and prescription uh this is the current edition the 11th edition uh this came out in 2020 that's 492 pages um it's about 40 dollars on amazon um, ACSM is the American College of Sports Medicine. It's a really, it's, this was a textbook when I did my bachelor's and my master's degree, obviously an earlier edition of it. But so this is, this is like, when we say like, what is best practice care? Like this is the literal definition of best practice care, right? So if, if you're an exercise physiologist and you work in a cardiac rehab ward, okay. And you've got someone who's just had a heart attack three days ago and you're walking them on a treadmill with a 12 lead ECG on them measuring their heart rhythms and stuff like in this book is a, is a definition of what you should, you know, how hard you should work them, what the signs are to stop, you know, all of those things. Um, so this is the literal definition of best practice. And it's not just for cardiac patients, for, for people with low back pain, healthy adults, pregnant women, people with osteoporosis, Parkinson's disease, arthritis, diabetes, heart failure, like there's, you know, the very older adults, kids, there's a very large number of conditions and, and, you know, healthy and diseased, you know, uh, situations covered in there. And it literally says, here's the, here's the exercise guidelines for this group, right? And this is $40. It comes out, it's renewed, you know, a new edition comes out every three or four years or so. Um, and uh, you just like, this is the best, Thing. This is the best. Like you literally just look it up. You go to think, oh, Parkinson's disease, bam, bam, bam. Do this many exercises, this many times per week. That's what it is. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's, that's my recommendation. And you should also, and, and this also has the guidelines for healthy adults, right? So it's like, if you just don't have any illness, you don't have any back pain, you don't have Parkinson's disease, you just want to be fit and strong and healthy and mobile. Okay. This tells you how much exercise to do and what kind of exercise to do, but it's not like, and, and the ACSM doesn't have a dog in the race, like they're not pushing some particular method or, you know, they don't care if you'd use weights or reformers or body weight or whatever, like they don't care about that. They just want you to bring your muscles to fatigue two to three times a week, you know? So it, it it's at the level of principles, not, they're not telling you do seven reps of, you know, a 12 kilo dumbbell, you know, they're not telling you like specific prescriptions <laughs> they're telling you general principles <laughs> so that's what you should read and 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 you don't but the thing is you don't read it cover to cover right i've never read this oh well, actually I, they made me read it cover to cover in university but this was like four editions ago but you just read it you just read like if you have a client who's coming in with back pain you read the chapter on back pain yeah and right? then yeah and, and then you know and then you can you can customize it to your own uh specific field or part of the field right. so pilates yeah you would incorporate it Mm -hmm. right. That's great. That's great that that exists. So shout out to them for creating that. That's it's amazing. Really well, if you, mm. if I reckon, if you're only going to read one book apart from my book, <laughs> I reckon this, <laughs> this is it. <laughs> so two books. Good. Yeah.
Okay. So with that, with all that said, um, do you have any advice for new Pilates instructors? Do you have any any pearls of wisdom to share with us? So that we can start our careers in maybe in hi- like in hindsight with everything that you've experienced. What would you say? What what would you what piece of advice would you give us? Well, what I want to give, I don't know about, I don't, I don't know if I can give general advice. I mean, because it depends what you want to achieve and who you are as a person, who you want to be as a person and where you are now, you know, personally and professionally and so many other things. I, I don't know about, I, I, but what I would love to do is maybe if you have more, sp- if I could ask you a couple of questions, then that, that maybe I could give you my thoughts then. Like, so, all right. So instead of like, in quotes, young instructors, let's yeah. call it, call, talk about Mary. <laughs> <laughs> who, I do like the word instructor? young though. That, that was, the, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, all right. So you, you kind of said, you know, the direction you want to head in, right? You want to know more about kinesiology and want to really understand, you know, anatomy and biomechanics, you know, on a deeper level. Absolutely. What about like career wise? Like what are your career goals? Like, you know, if you couldn't fail, right? Like right. where would you be in say five years or in 10 years even in your career? If I couldn't fail, what a great question. Um, I've always very much liked the idea of I love the in-person training very much. So I really like to have a person physically be in front of me and to teach them and to send them off kind of floating into into the rest of their day. But I also really like the idea of having Pilates be accessible to as many people as possible. I I found Pilates at a very it was a it was a darker time in my life in the sense that I'd just been to uni, I studied photography. And I was just getting into the industry and I was finding that it wasn't for me. And I had this dream of becoming this fashion photographer that when I went into the fashion photography world, it wasn't the world for me at all. And it started to really, I was, I had a lot of questions of who am I? What am I doing? What do I want now? And I found Pilates very superficially. It was just sort of, how do I, how do I look better? And I found a Pilates class right next door to my house at the time in London. And I went and I, something clicked in my head, like something very, I just, I loved it. The teacher was so kind. The, the group, it was a group class. I think there were six reformers in there. Um, they were all so supportive and everybody spoke to me after and said, what a great job I did. And I was like, I need to keep doing this. There's, there was something about that environment. There was, I, I also used to dance as a kid. So I think there was something about the very the, the very precise movements, that something about the way that my body felt after. It all just really clicked. And that, that was the moment I knew I had to do this. Um, it just took a little bit of time to actually jump into it professionally. So I was always just doing it as a, um, as a student. Um, now to, to go back to your question, I really want to keep on having people physically in front of me and, and, and having a community with physical people, I would really love to keep, I love the one-on-ones because I really think that you get to know your body. I get to know you. We have a very good time, but I also would love for Pilates. I would love for more people to feel what I felt in that first class. I want people to really experience that what Pilates can do or just what any movement can do. And I think judging by what COVID has brought us in terms of the digital sphere, I would really love to take my practice digital as well. So to have Pilates be one-on-one, some groups, but also accessible to the masses anywhere in the world digitally, that's where I would love for my career to be. Mm. And do you see that uh, like yourself teaching digitally like live or sort of as an on-demand thing or... Really so this is this, point. this is something I'm toying with because this is quite new to me. I've never actually done like a real digital class. I've done the YouTube videos and co- during COVID, that's how kind of how I postpartum sort of went back into back into exercise, and it was great that they existed. But there's not that many of them. They're not, mm. and if they're and if they do exist, at least I'm not. I wasn't finding them, and I think there's a lot of. There's a lot of potential there. You had a guest on, I'm really sorry, I can't remember her name, but I think she had a brilliant idea. Her her business model was to have Pilates classes online 
uh, as challenges. So she was focusing on challenges. And that's exactly Hannah. how yeah. Hannah, she was, that was such a great interview because I thought that's exactly how I got back into Pilates. I had a 28 day challenge and I did it. And I felt so accomplished after, right? So it's seeing, it's seeing how people are doing it now and how technology is absolutely booming and growing and seeing what I can do with all of that and how I can hopefully bring it to as many people as possible. That's amazing. Well, and what do you think is stopping you from doing that right now? I think it's still that same feeling that I reached out to you with. It's that imposter syndrome if we want to, let's call it that, because it does, it just feels like, who do you think you are telling all these people what to do? <laughs> like telling, uh, telling all, so many people what to do. Um, when you can't really figure out what you're not figure out what you're doing, but when you're still coming to grips with your, your personal philosophies and what you stand for, I feel like I'm just not at that next step yet. But funny enough, what I've learned in Pilates is do the scary, scary things. I, I was telling you, uh, going on this podcast really reminds me of, um, teaching my first group class, <laughs> like that nervous feeling and get pushing through that that fear pilates has given me that professionally like just do it just do the scary thing and you'll be fine <laughs> and everyone will survive yeah. Yeah. and like you said teaching actually was what took away your fear of teaching absolutely yeah just keep you know? doing it keep showing up even if even if even if you don't want to at that very moment just keep showing up and you, it's the consistency it compounds right so you the confidence comes with doing it over and over again. Yeah. Um, so I guess, so so I'm not sure if you answered the question or not. So what is stopping you from doing that right now? I think this is the first time I've really thought about that question. It's a difficult one to answer. I, what is stopping me? I have absolutely no idea. I think I need to figure out how to manage my time, pool the resources to do I mean, going digital, from what I understand, you actually need quite a good marketing strategy. I think I, I say there aren't very many digital Pilates instructors, but in the grand scheme of things, there are and they're competing. Right. So it, it's about assessing the, the market and it's about finding your sort of unique perspective, like why go with me and not somebody else and, and really start to hone in. I think one step at a time for me. So we've just kind of gotten over the hump of, OK, I know what I'm doing. Um, I know what I like. I'm starting to understand my own personal philosophy. And then the next step, maybe 2023 goal is to really, really work on this, on what you're, on what we're talking about, on taking it digital and seeing mm. where to go from there. Mm. Uh, a, a great question, you know, Peter Thiel, who I admire uh, in business, in the business world, who wrote a book called Zero to One, he founded PayPal. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and so he asked a great question once, which was based, he said something like, you know, your, your 10 year goal, you know, why can't you just do that in the next six months? You know, why, why does it have to be sort of out there at some vague future time? And, uh, I think that's a, you know, that's the, that's the question I'd like to, you know, you to, you to ponder. <laughs> yeah. That's a very good one. I really like that too. What is his name? Peter Thiel, T-H-I-E-L. You know, T T oh, T L with an H. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good book. He wrote a book called Zero to One, which I highly recommend if you're into entrepreneurship, which you are, because you want to start an online Pilates thing. Um, uh, so I think there's uh, a lot. Uh, so I 100% agree that you need to, what you said there, um, basically understand the market and you know to a certain extent understand where you where there's a gap okay where there's an unmet need and then um you know create something that meets that need effectively uh so i agree with you that there's some research and planning that's required in order to succeed but i would say i would consider the research and planning to be part of the work of building the business right it's just like phase one is research and planning you know, phase two is building, phase three is launching. Um, and uh, you know, I think, but a lot of people seem to get stuck in the research and planning stage for decades. Um, and so I guess my advice to you would be, if this is something that's really important to you that you want to do, 
do it now. Like start, start today. And, you know, so yes, research, yes, plan, but put a, an end date on that. So, okay, I'm going to spend the next four weeks researching and planning, right? And put a deadline on it, okay? And, and create some discipline around, okay, what does researching and planning mean? What do you do in the morning when you wake up? That, yeah, what's researching and planning? Okay, I'm going to look at X number of websites. I'm going to buy an industry report. I'm going to, you know, whatever, okay? Uh, and then I'm going to, you know, look on forums. I'm going to look at what works in adjacent industries, maybe online fitness, you know, personal training, online yoga, you know, what's what's working there, what's not working there. And I'm going to go, you know what? I think this person is doing a brilliant thing in the fitness space and there's no one doing that in the Pilates space, you know? You know, or maybe there's Hannah over in Ireland doing this awesome challenge thing in the Pilates space. You can just do the same thing, but like base your challenges around a slightly different set of goals, right? So, right? So she's into like, you know, get over your back pain, get strong, do the 34 exercises for 12 weeks, whatever. Okay. Yep. You might have a slightly different set of challenges, right? Yep. You can just use the exact same model, right? So find something that's the best way is to find something that's already working, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. 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 And yeah. just do that, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. How all good businesses are for. <laughs> but right. no, yeah, there is definitely something to it, right? Absolutely. But you, you also, you started from a business. you you started by opening a studio, right? I remember listening to how you opened a studio and you were sort of shifting around the space. So you had, you, you figured out that the best way to make profit was to, to add more reformers. So you had, I remember there was an episode where you were saying you had a big lobby space where everybody could sort of con is it congregate the word, but everybody could meet. Um, and then you were like, no, that's not making me any money. Let's, let's put some reformers in there. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, but, but then that grew. So you, you, you no longer a studio, you don't run a studio, you run an educational facility, right? So you, you just evolved, which is, yeah, which is great, which is very inspirational because it's interesting from where I'm standing right now, it's really nice to see what can be achieved. Well, I think you can achieve pretty much anything you want. Like there are people, you can parlay your, you know, like you can sort of trade your Pilates teaching skills into anything. You can be a Pilates teacher, you know, you can be, you can be a Pilates business owner, you know, you can be a Pilates like social media influencer. You can be a Pilates educator, you know, like there you can, you could get into your own line of Pilates equipment. You know, you could coach people who teach Pilates online. Like there's so many, you know, things that you could do with that, you know, basic skill set of not that teaching Pilates is a basic skill, but with that sort of like foundational skill set of, you know, the central skill set of being a Pilates teacher, okay, you can add on coaching skills or add on entrepreneurial skills or add on, you know, building a small business, you know, from home or online or, you know, like, and so you can really do anything. I mean, you look at, you know, you know, I'm fascinated and quite a bit obsessed by business in general. And so I look at people in all different kinds of industries who do really well. And there are people that make like millions out of being personal trainers or dry cleaning business, or like you can just get the most like seemingly humble set of skills and turn it into an empire, you know? And so you can definitely do that with Pilates. Like, you know, there's, there's, there's really no upper limit, I think, to what you can do. You know, I mean, all right, no upper limit. I don't think Pilates, my prediction is Pilates is not going to ever have as universal appeal as something like, I don't know, PayPal, where it's like, okay, we all use, we all transact online. You know, it doesn't matter if you're old, young, fat, thin, black, white, you know, like we all transact online. And so it's not really about special interests or being a certain type of person or anything like that. Whereas Pilates appeals to a, a subset of humanity, right? We, I don't think we're ever going to get every, every person on the planet, you know, doing Pilates. Like we've got like, what do they got? Like something like three or 4 billion subscribers on Facebook, you know, like, you know, I, I don't think we're going to, I don't think we're going to get there that far with Pilates, right? But you can, I think you could still run a, hundred million dollar a year business in the Pilates industry, you know, there's definitely scope for that, I think. Yeah. Well, but in the same breath though, you say that it can't be uh, like PayPal where anybody can transact. 
the end of the day, the guidelines exist. Everybody has to move, whether it's Pilates yes. or not, right? So there's some right. there's something there. <laughs> All right. Well, you can take up the Benjamin Zander challenge and and oh, and get God. them get them all doing Pilates. That's awesome. Oh God, right. no, I, no. I, but I do say even to all my clients, I have a lot of hesitant male, not even clients. It's the the partners of my female clients, and that they, they won't they won't delve into the Pilates world. And I always say Pilates is not for everybody because just like cycling is not for everybody, just like running is not for everybody. It's not important what you're doing. It's important that you're doing something. And whatever it is, you have to find what you enjoy. I love Pilates very much. It really, it speaks to the little girl in me who loved to dance and it really, it just works and I see it changing lives. But that's not the same thing for Joe down the street. You know what I mean? He might like to swim and he should swim <laughs> as long as he's swimming. <laughs> right. I think, you know, I, I think I agree with you. I think, you know, when I, a, a lot of people, I had Martin on this podcast a, a little while ago and He's, you know, he wants to get more men into Pilates and, you know, I respect that and I admire his work, but, you know, it always kind of perplexes me a little bit, I guess, when people say I want to get more men into Pilates, I think like, why? Like there are so many women who want to do Pilates. Why not just accommodate them? Like, you know, service, service the people who want to do Pilates, <laughs> let them do Pilates. <laughs> like when, 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 when everybody who wants to do Pilates is already doing Pilates, okay, then let's get the men into it. But if you're if you're opening a small business, right, and you you've got bills to pay and you need to get money in the door, right? Who's a better client? Someone who loves Pilates and wants to do it, or someone who doesn't give a shit about it and is you know? And you have to work to twice as hard, yeah, to get them in. Right. Yeah, no, I hear what you're saying. I really do. So yeah. and, you know, like there are men, myself, Martin. You know, there's a bunch yeah. of men who love Pilates, right? Great. Let let the men who love Pilates do Pilates, but. It's basically like, I just think, well, why swim against the stream? You know, why, why try and convince someone to do something they don't want to do? Why not just get someone who already wants to do the thing and help them do it? Yeah. You know? No, that's a great There's point. There's plenty of them. There's plenty of them. That's absolutely right. We just have to find them. <laughs> get, them get them to keep doing it. Yeah. So, um, so that was my advice. That was my advice for young Pilates instructors, I guess, is – is figure out, like, ask yourself, and like, I liked a little values reflection that you did there, Mary, like, you know, what what do I want to do? What is important to me? And, I, you know, it, I think that's a really important thing to do for all of us, because even if you've done it before, things change. And I know, you know, when I reflect, sometimes I realize like, oh, yeah, some of the things I'm doing or some of the goals I had are not important to me anymore, you know? Like my wife and I were talking over Christmas and New Year's because that, you know, that's a natural kind of time to reflect and think about, okay, where are we going to take this and whatever. And we've got a set of financial goals for this business. You know, we run the business together uh, and we have a set of financial goals for business. Uh, and our next milestone is to hit $10 million revenue in a year, right? So that's the goal that we're going for. And then she, my wife, Julie, she said to me like, okay, so what's next after that? You know, do you want to go for 50 million? I'm like, well, it doesn't really motivate me. Like, I feel like if you're making $10 million, like 50 million, will it really make any difference? You know, like why, <laughs> you know, like how many houses can you live in? How many cars can you drive? How many, you know, like why that doesn't really motivate me, but what does motivate me is reaching more people and, and you know, having conversations like this, like you said, when clients float out of your session, right? That's the moment of dopamine release. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and for me, you know, I don't teach sessions anymore, but I, I have these conversations. I write books. I've just, just finished writing my second book. I've, you know, I've, I, um, uh, I teach courses and, and I, I, you know, fairly regularly, I get messages from people on social media saying, oh, I read your book and I did X, Y, and Z and now it's working better or I listen to your podcast and I put my prices up and now I'm making twice as much money, um, you know, and that gives me a massive high. And so I want to help the Pilates industry, you know, Pilates instructors out of entrepreneurial poverty, you know, and into abundance and financial, you know, independence, you know, at the same time as they're already doing this amazing work, changes people's lives through the exercise, but they're not getting financially rewarded for it. You know, so that's what motive. That's what that's what motivates me, and and so I think, and that, I only realised that over, you know, over the last month because my wife 
and I had that conversation that that had been growing in me. That's like, oh, yeah, you know, 50 million, 100 million doesn't really draw me. You know, it's like it doesn't it doesn't motivate me at all, really. Um, and so I think that's really important for each of us. You know, I think doing it on a fairly regular basis, at least once a year and reflecting, going, what is what is actually important? Where do I want to go? And then just like, well, what's stopping me doing that right now? Why don't I just do that right now? That's you know? great advice, honestly. It's a scary thing to come to. It's a scary, it is. It, there's a lot of fear in it, right? And I think you talk about fear a lot on your podcast, but it really is. It's once you just step into it and step past it, there's so many great things you can achieve. So thank you. That's a really good thing to think about. Yeah. Well, you don't have like that. I think, you know, I'm sure we've said a million times before that I think that the solution to, to feeling fear is not to like get over the fear. It's just to do the thing despite the fear. And and then the fear goes away afterwards. It does. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> it really does. Like this podcast, I feel great now. <laughs> but before we chatted, I was terrified. <laughs> I told you. Yeah. Oh, um, okay. Tell me about what you look for in a mentor. If there's a way to measure it, I think if we share a similar set of values in what we're looking for, not just the end product of why we're doing it, but the process of work that maybe like in, in your case, you have gone through a process that I would see myself going through. So you're, you're naturally somebody that I would be attracted to, to learn more from. Um, my mentors here, they generally, I, I once read a book called What Color Is Your Parachute? I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great book. They give you exercises in how to sort of, uh, I think it, I, they sell it as this is what you need to do to get to get a great interview result. But actually, they give you a set of exercises halfway through the book and it really makes you reevaluate your values and what you want out of your career. And I think I did this in 2018 and I think they update it every year. But that really at the in the center so they make a little flower and at the center in the flower has like what do you want your day to look like what do you want your um the people you work with what do they like it really it really gives you a big picture of what your values are in your career and at the center of those that flower it asks you if if you were to leave this earth and you were to make a mark on it what would you want to leave behind like what would you want people to 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 know not to know about you but what is your mark on the world? What do you want to leave behind? And I really found that my value is joy. Like I really deeply want people to feel joy. There is something in me that when people, and I know there's a science behind happiness and all of that, but I genuinely think that especially in times like this, we could all use just a little bit more joy. <laughs> and I think when I find mentors who bring me that feeling, that really attracts me, especially if they're experts in the field. That's just a, that's just a match made in heaven for me. I really think that's, yeah. Mm. Look at it. John Gary's word is fun. Fun. So you guys are pretty closely aligned there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he is. He is something though. I really I think you called him like the Elvis of the Pilates world, and I was like, yeah, <laughs> that's it. <him." laughs> I remember even watching him in the stop videos, just the educational videos, and like he couldn't even help himself. Like he has such a personality. It's just so great. <laughs> and he's like that in person too. Like yeah, I've I had dinner with him and and stayed with him and. And oh, that's, that's what he's like. Like he's not putting it on for the camera. That's actually what he's yeah, like. Yeah, that's him. He can't, he can't be anything but that. Yeah, you can tell. You can see it. Yeah, it's so great. Yeah, I definitely, I, I understand that a lot. Uh, feels, like we're, feels like we're just about done. Is there anything else you want to say or anything else you want to share? I think you've gone beyond answering my questions. I think this conversation has gone into a very very good direction and very insightful. I would love to say thank you to you for taking the time to have it with me I think well, I didn't expect this much of a this much motivation if that makes sense yeah I feel very motivated to now look at, look at my goals <laughs> great um well you know this is a, you know I love this conversation uh it's you know I think what I've loved about talking with you is you're so uh, a combination of articulate humble, curious, intelligent, 
you know, you've you've thought deeply about some of these topics, about your own values and about what, what does it mean to be a good Pilates instructor and what do you want to, you know, what mark do you want to leave in the world? Uh, and and you're willing to just be honest. Right. And I really value that. Um, and, you know, that, I mean, that's kind of a big sort of theme of this podcast is we try and just cut the shit and just yeah. be as real as possible. Yeah. Uh, and so I appreciate you. I appreciate you doing that. Thank you so much. Honestly, I mean it. And I hope anybody listening, I hope it really, really helped them too. maybe made sense of some things that I was very confused about. You know, I'm sure it has because that's been my experience with just, I think pretty much every single episode I get at least a few people message me going, oh my God, that was just exactly what I was thinking. And even episodes, like some of the episodes Chloe and I did early in the early days where I was like, we got off air and I was like, oh, that was terrible. That was shit, you know? <laughs> and then, you know, next day you get people messaging, oh my God, that was the best episode ever. You know, so you just, there's, there's someone somewhere who's listening to this right now going, oh my God, that's exactly yeah. well, I <laughs> what hope I needed. So. I hope so. Because for me, that's exactly what I needed. <laughs> yeah. So I hope someone else um, could and share that. The people, the people who you know turned off after the first five minutes, they probably don't message me, but you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Maybe that's for the best. <laughs> um, thanks, Mary. Uh, really great to talk with you. And thank uh, you very I'll talk much. To you next time. Me too. Take care. <laughs> <laughs>